mean no? Okay, okay, okay. Welcome back to the From the Fabricator podcast. I'm your host, Max Perlstein. Thank you so much for joining me once again this month uh, on the podcast. Uh, a fun one once again. Interesting one. Learned a lot uh, this month. And so we'll talk about the guests coming up in a moment. But as always, this podcast is brought to you by MyGlassClass.com from the National Glass Association. MyGlassClass.com. Uh, tons of courses, 24-7, 365, even a bunch uh, in Spanish. This was built by the industry, for the industry, the NGA. They know what they're doing with training. So this is glass and glazing training through myglassclass.com. Check it out. There's sections now in there for apprentice training, sections in there also for my glass fab, which is new for the fabricator. So that is myglassclass.com from the NGA. All right. Uh, one quick note, also on the NGA, glass and glazing advocacy days are coming up. And if you are interested in going to Washington, D.C. and representing the industry, uh, go to glass.org to learn more, or you can hit me up and I'll point you to the right link. All right. On today's show, uh, real excited. Uh, two sets uh, of guests. Uh, first up, we go on the, the paint and finishing side. This is an area that I'm not very well educated in. I learned a lot. Uh, probably asked some dumb questions, I will admit that, but uh, the guys were really good to me. Neil Chrisman and Chris Incorvea uh, were my guests, and I probably mispronounced his name. I, I I feel bad about that. I'm terrible with names. Anyway, Neil and Chris were fantastic. Uh, enjoyed getting to learn a little bit about what's going on in that world. And Neil uh, Neil's past is, fan, fan, is, is really, really something. Uh, more than 50 years in our industry, and he is still on fire and moving forward and doing some great things. And then after that, talking about doing great things, Tom Donovan from Thompson Innovative Glass in Michigan. They are on fire. They are really moving and grooving with innovative glass products. They have evolved as a company. They're in a lot of different spaces, bird, security, school, so on, and then some new stuff like heated glass. He gets into all of that. And we uh, we talk a lot of Cleveland Brown, too. Cleveland Brown's history, you know, I'm a sports buff, so that was a lot of fun. So stay tuned. I've got uh, Neil and Chris starting off, Tom on the backside, and then I'll see you on the other side with my TV recommendation and wrap-up. Thank you very much. Here we go. Okay, okay. Kicking it off uh, on this next edition of the From the Fabricator podcast, I'm joined by a pair of gentlemen, and I'm excited to learn because, as I was telling them before we started, this is one of those rare uh, opportunities for me to really learn about something I don't know a lot about. I don't know uh, a lot about what they do and the nitty gritty, the work that they're doing in the industry, the way that they're helping out the industry. So this is a chance for me to learn. For the listeners to learn, so really thrilled to have Neil Chrisman with with me. Uh, he's started a. You may know him from Spectrum uh, PPG. He's been around. Uh, he told me fifty years. We're going to learn a little bit more about that. He started a new advisory group called Pictura, uh, and he's also uh, joined with uh, Chris Incorvaya of Edge Facade. Uh, you can find his stuff online at Edge Arc E E D G E. A-R-C dot com slash facade. Neil, Chris, thanks so much for doing the podcast. Thanks for having us, Max. Awesome. Thanks, Max. I appreciate awesome. the opportunity. Awesome to have you guys here. And so I'm going to start with you, Neil. Uh, you know, again, I think what's interesting, you mentioned to me 50 years, coming up on 50 years, your nonstop energizer bunny of this industry. Uh, you know, you, you said you said you're you're semi-retired. You, you do more work than most people that are working like 70 hours a week, my friend. Uh, talk to me, though, about the past. You know, how did how did 50 plus years ago, did you get into this business? And, you know, talk about your your you know, your long and winding road on the paint and, and glass and glazing side of our world. Well, it's uh, it's an incredible journey. I was a graduate of uh, industrial marketing out of Penn State in 1974. Uh, the job directly out of college, I had an opportunity to, to uh, jump into a sales and marketing role with PPG Industries at the time. It was Pittsburgh Plate Glass. Uh, I was trained as a bench chemist and uh, moved me into the coatings and residence division of PPG back in 1974. And through various sales and marketing positions all over the country, um, I ended up going back to corporate for mergers and acquisitions, and then an opportunity to run a, what they call a, a global business manager for the extrusion, architectural extrusion division of building products within CNR, Coatings Residence of PPG. So for 18 years, uh, from 1974 to basically 1980, 1993, um, I was a global business manager for PPG's extrusion coatings divisions architecturally, 
Uh, I spent many years in Southeast Asia uh, building paint lines and selling the PPG products such as Duranar uh, globally uh, in Asia Pacific and then turned around and they sent me to Europe, did the same thing in Europe and then came back and uh, in, in resigned after 18 years to buy Spectrum in 1993. So I went from selling paint to applying paint. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, for the last 30 years, I've been running Spectrum, building it a, as a brand for a, we, we uh, specialize in both applications of, ar of architectural coatings in liquid and in powder. We do not anodize. Uh, we have a huge facility, 70,000 square feet located in uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Right. Uh, I just sort of semi-retired and sold my business to my son. Gotcha. Neil Neil four, I think it was in December of 2021. So I understand he's doing a great job, but so I'm sort of out the pasture, so to speak. But uh, the situation is apparent that I've got my Rolodex is, you know, pages and pages long. So I'm still getting calls from architects, developers, curtain wall contractors, you name it. They said, Neil, I trust what you've been doing for 50 years. I need your help. I just decided, hey, I might as well benefit on this and try to be in some sort of a consulting advisor or a forum. And I, I've been working undercover with several other people and projects until up till now and decided to put together this Pictoria, P-I-C-T-U-R-A advisory group. And just so you know, Pictoria is Latin for to paint. So gotcha. it, all fall, it all falls into the same finishing architectural coatings group. So uh, that's where we are. I like it. I like it. Uh, and, and now, Chris, how do you follow that act? Uh, you know, co covering covering Asia, starting paint lines, basically basically inventing paint uh, is is where Neil does, and then he did it. So I, I feel I feel for you, Chris. Talk to me about your past, and uh, I'll help build it up a little bit along the way. I'm sure it's pretty yeah. impressive. Talk to me. I, I wish I had the uh, the highlights and accolades of Neil's career, but um, me too. Me too. But I'm not I'm not quite at the 50 year mark there, so I, I got some time to maybe catch up a little bit. You bet. You bet. Great. Um, yeah, I've got a, a bit of an interesting uh, introduction to this um, uh, this field. So I started my professional career um, 18 years ago, right out of college in this industry. Okay, what, um, what college? Where'd you go? I'm curious. I'm uh, Ohio curious. Wesleyan University. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I went to Ohio, Ohio U in, in Athens. So oh, I know Ohio okay. Wesleyan. We, we lost in basketball one year to Ohio Wesleyan, actually. <laughs> It was really rough. It shouldn't happen because you were a D1 school. It, exactly. My senior year. Sorry, I'm way off. I'm a big Ohio basketball guy. But go ahead. Back 18 years. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, that's I, great. I, so, sorry to interrupt uh, you. I came out of school with a general business degree. And my first assignment, the first company I got hired with, uh, was quite a fun one. I got sent overseas um, to Ireland and UK. Okay. When I was there, uh, I did not get to use my college degree. I was in the field <laughs> as a laborer, which was wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I got to learn how to restore uh, the architectural factory finishes on high-end aluminum clad windows and doors. Interesting. Um, I got to go out in the field. We got to travel uh, all of Ireland and most of UK. We were up and down the coast uh, at high-end homes, uh, restoring the, the architectural finishes that were put on them. Um, and so that was a really unique and neat um, experience for me. I think I spent about eight months overseas doing that. Um, came back, um, and then for many years after I came back to the States, stayed with the same company, I worked in operations and project management, uh, mm -hmm. focused on the restoration and maintenance of curtain walls and facades. So existing structures, um, either, you know, repurposing them, uh, restoring them, extending the service life uh, on those structures. Uh, eventually, after doing that for you know, over a decade, um, I, I gained enough knowledge to move into business development and the consulting side of the business, um, which was which is incredible to be able to create, um, you know, uh, create opportunities and create unique solutions uh, for these existing buildings that are there. Okay. Um, today, I own Edge Facade, um, which is a firm that, that we develop specifically to service the industry for these architectural finishes, um, both in restoration, but also in the new construction side. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. Interesting. So congrats on that. That, that you know, there's, that's, a, that's a nice little run. And, and it had to be interesting to start your career overseas uh, in, in uh, you know, on the ground too. Uh, that, 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 that's a heck of a, a heck of an accomplishment. Congrats to you. Yeah. Appreciate it. I would have had it no other way, learning it from the ground up and understanding uh, how these, 
coatings perform and also how they can be restored successfully was was a great uh, jump start to my career. Yeah, yeah, and and then I'm sure it still helps you to this day too. So very very interesting. So so back to you, Neil. Uh, you, you've started Pictura. Uh, you're, you're you're involved uh, in in everything. People still calling you. So what what's hot and happening in your world now? Uh, that that I know that when you 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 and I initially talked about doing a podcast together, there was a lot of different a lot of different different things swirling around. So it's you, you guys aren't uh, aren't slow. You or Chris right now. Uh, there, there's a lot a lot of different things going on. So what do you got going on, uh, Neil, uh, day to day? Well, basically, right now I got a twofold thing going on right now. One is the first is to educate the architects and building owners and project managers on all issues related to the architectural coatings market. And second is to address the potential problems and pitfalls. The architects and the specifiers writing the specifications are not suitable for that project in the environment where it's going to be exposed. So they, they run all this, you know, like the project managers, uh, the developers run a series of questions through me. Uh, and I'm looking at filiform corrosion, uh, corrosion and its cause. Example, seacoast applications. Is it good? Is it not good? What, what coatings do you recommend for seacoast applications? Um, I'm looking at, uh, you know, the geography and the possible corrosion issues at the site, comparing aluminum and steel, the proper pretreatment techniques, the primer versus no primer, clear coats, no clear coats on the coating systems required, uh, one, two, three coats if, 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 if required, um, and anodized versus powder versus liquid. Wow. So, so yeah, all of yeah. this is coming into help me build a, 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 a coatings specification for that particular job at that particular site. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so architects and specifiers are leaning on your knowledge on that whole wide range of, of insight and info. Got right. it. Yeah. Just recently I had a, uh, a, a recent opportunities um, as a technical advisor with SOM, Skidmore, Wines and Merle. Sure. Sure. Up in New York. And uh, I am currently developing a master spec to try to address all these coatings questions or a white paper of sort to be able to uh, navigate each individual building owner or project. And the critical issue that SOM gave me to look at, and I'm gonna read this to you, but it's called, the critical issue is, is, is how do we align architects, paint manufacturers, painting applicators, fabricators, contractors and owners about the specification, what is critical here is their expectation because they've had so many critical issues. Basically, the owner has a paper chip from the architect. Right. And when it absolutely is applied and installed in the building, it's two different colors. Right. So there's an expectation that we have to build and how do you follow that process through line samples and how do we get approvals before all of this gets done and on the building and they don't like it. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to definitely talk a little bit more about those those issues, but but alignment and managing expectations uh, yeah. are, are two things that I take away from that. That's a ch- heck of a challenge. Uh, and we'll definitely dig more into that. But Chris, how about you day to day with Edge Facade? You mentioned <laughs> you mentioned kind of why you started it and, you know, you own this company and you manage managing partner and you've got something going on. But what is what's the day to day look like for you? Yeah, I mean, our main mission is is finding and developing building envelope solutions. And it's twofold for us. I mean, one is restoring existing buildings, um, which primarily is in the commercial world, office buildings, uh, mid to high rise, you know, structures in in major metropolitan. So there's that end of it, uh, which is really important to the industry, right? Uh, There's not a lot of uh, building skins being ripped off and replaced. So the idea is keep the tenants happy and comfortable with being able to restore the exterior of those buildings uh, and maintain operations. The, the other side of it um, in the new construction world is us um, being able to service uh, these architectural coatings in the field. Um, a lot of these finishes get damaged during installation. They get damaged by other trades. Um, and sometimes, which you know isn't uh, ideal, you just have a factory failure. You have a factory failure in coating um, due to pretreat, due to coating application, due to something in the QA, QC process that didn't go um, accordingly. Uh, and so we're there in, uh, in this industry to support this um, repair side of it, report the, um, sorry, support the performance side of it. So we're able to go out in the field, make these repairs in, in situ and, and be able to um, continue uh, or at least have the owner continue with their warranty um, as expected. 
Gotcha, gotcha. The re- and the renovation thing, it's been a that's been a something I've been banging on for a while. Is I think that that's a a, a business that's going to continue to grow for so many reasons. But you're right, nobody wants to rip things out if they don't have to, and especially if the the structure's solid, the bones are solid. You know, and, and so I assume that's what you're running into is aesthetically things aren't looking the greatest, you know, but the, if the bones are solid, you're able to help people kind of get over that hump. Yeah, exactly. And so we're taking it a step further. And now we're starting to delve into um, not only the, you know, the the aesthetics part of, of the coding application and beautifying a building and preserving the architectural aluminum, but we're getting involved in the waterproofing, the sealants and the gaskets and the things that, that keep water out of the structure. And then in addition to that, we're also looking at performance of the building. So we're looking at glazing retrofits, um, being able to assist in that end of it. So if you're going to access a building from the exterior and, and hang a, a swing stage and address the waterproofing and sealants, um, we're looking and making sure people are at least considering what sort of you know value can I do to increase um, the performance of the structure um, through the glazing side as well. Yeah. And, and in some cases, like in New York, they have to uh, improve it because of the New York local law 97. So uh, you're probably sitting in the right place at the right time. Where are you located, Chris? I know so, you, N- Neil mentioned Youngstown, Ohio. Where are you located? Yeah. So I'm out of Tampa, Florida. Um, okay. That's where I'm, that's where I'm, I'm both based, uh, home based, but we cover the nation. Okay. Um, we deploy most of our team out of uh, the Texas market. Um, cool. but we've got a nice national footprint. Nice, 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 nice. Uh, so, so Neil, let's let's talk about uh, the issues and adventures out there because you've seen your you've you've seen your fair share. Uh, if, if, first, though, is is it are things better now than they were like maybe 15, 20 years ago, or are they getting worse? Uh, and, and, and especially with the people that you deal with. And the reason I ask that is that uh, it seems like we have like this this lack of. Uh, like tribal knowledge from the people that you deal with on a day-to-day basis. And they, they, they may not know it, but that might be my opinion. Uh, what are you seeing out there and what are the big issues that you're, you're dealing with and, and helping solve right now? Well, I think like exactly what you said, I think the, uh, the expectation of, I'm not saying the, the, uh, the millennials at 35, 36, sure. uh, there are very few people that have the kind of knowledge that you and I have had all over these years. And it's very, 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 uh, I should say, not disappointing, but surprising to me that I'm getting calls from 35-year-old project managers and architects that are cutting and pasting the old AMA specs that they seem to be relevant and haven't really dug into it exactly. And they're really using old technology and old specifications for the environment that doesn't exist anymore. So I'm trying to walk them through... uh, you know, you just can't go in there, you know, uh, to the old Alma specs and and think that you're creating a specification that's going to be uh, around for 20 years. So it's a situation I'm trying to do a lot of education to the younger project managers. And the biggest thing is showing them and photographs, detailing samples, showing them why you use a clear coat, why is powder versus better than liquid, uh, the restoration market with Chris, he's part of my team. One thing he and I are working on right now is that not only do you have to get the factory plan and baked on finish available and approved, but if you're smart and you're doing this up front, you need to get the touch-up system that is currently that's, if they got an approved color, you got to get the air dry system for the restoration repair market approved up front because at the end they forget about it and nothing matches. So I also am looking at trying to, use the knowledge that I have with regard to the substrates. Do we do ACM, composite, coil composite? Do we use eighth inch plate extrusions? Do we use uh, anodized versus paint versus powder? So all these questions come up from the standpoint of what is the best possible coating system for that end used application within that environment, sea coast or whatever. Uh, because that could you just said it because that depending on where it's at if it's in new york or it's in tampa it, it's a totally different angle but the the younger architect the younger specifier you know they may be grabbing an old spec copy paste and not realize that the application is wrong because of the, the of, of the orientation of the area it's going in yeah and just in another example uh i got a, a, a conversation with an architect in chicago i said you know, so you need like a Seaco specification for Chicago. I said, why would you want to do that? And I said, I said, basically, I said, you need, you don't understand that when you, when the city of Chicago plows all that snow and ice up against your building, 
all that salt sitting there from the first couple floors. So the guy totally realizes he has same salt corrosion issues if you're sitting in Florida as the snow plow that just piled all the rock salt up against your building. He never thinks twice about it. That so, that, that that you just made that you made a light bulb just go off in my head with that one. That was and, I, and I'm thinking, you know, you, you don't think about this. No, you're thinking about Salt Lake City. Oh my God, yeah. why I, do I need uh, you know Seacoast? Yes, you do. You know, so you know then and then there's a constant conversation about. Okay, if it's Seacoast application, how far? Is it a mile? Is it two miles? Is it right. five miles? We have documentation that the Seacoast application issues and all that particular, uh, the winds and the rains carry it all the way into Atlanta. Wow. So a lot of people don't realize I'm okay if I'm a mile in. I'm okay if I'm five miles in. Yeah. Not necessarily. And you got to make sure that if it's a Seacoast application, the proper pretreatments, primer, no primer, what is my best application for all of that? And none of that is out there anymore because it's all with the 50 year old guys, you know, and it's hard to get them assimilated because if it's not zoom or if it's not readily in front of them on the internet, they don't get it. And, and, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but on that note, how, how do we, uh, you know, how do we get this message out? I mean, I know you've started your firm and Chris is doing what he's doing, but, uh, I, 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 it seems to me like a pretty big problem in trying to get in front of people to explain all of these things. What, what are your thoughts there, Neil? Well, I think I can lean on my days at PPG and even Spectrum that um, we have a considerable amount of impact when we do these box lunch presentations. When we can get all the architecture project managers in one conference room, because everybody has a separate project. So going to each individual project manager is, 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 is an incredible amount of time to do that right. and help through so we at spectrum we at ppg i'm sure chris as well we offer these box lunch presentations so we have uh we bring all the project managers into the conference room we supply them lunch uh they don't waste any of their company's time from 12 to 1 we have a 45 50 minute presentation q a they have lunch yeah. they go back um, we have a uh, an immediate dialogue uh, they have a reference that they can refer back to so um, they've seen all the samples, they've seen what happens with and without a clear coat, so to speak, the difference between anodized versus paint. So I think right now, collectively, these box lunch presentations are a way to get to that younger, the team members all in one time. Right. Just so many. That's the thing. Right. And there's just there's so many. And, and so, so Chris, uh, you know, it, you know, I'd like to have you answer also, you know, how we get the, the word out as well, but what are, what are the kind of the big, you know, uh, you know, Neil just ran down a pretty big issue there. The salt, the salt, something, my answer would have been, well, Lake Michigan, you know, it, it, you know, maybe there's some salt left over in Lake Michigan. I don't know, but uh, you yeah. know, what, what are your, your issues that you're running into and how do we educate? How do we build? Yeah, um, I think I'll start with education. And Please. what I found, I've, I've done exactly uh, for many, many years, what Neil just said is that box lunch, uh, get in that lunchroom, that conference room and sit with those folks. What I think, and this is such an old story and I'm done talking about it, but I think we have to bring it up anyways, is COVID changed the way that people are interacting. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. and we, are, we are doing a lot of these webinars. And so it's not necessarily the lunch and learn anymore. It's the, it's the learn. And for example, I have four this week set up. I've got four Zoom meetings with folks sitting in a conference room or not, and they're sitting at their offices at home or, or they're spread out. So having the ability of people to accept you on a webinar versus an in-person meeting, because they're all now moved, you know, they're all sitting in different places. It's been great to have the acceptance level of that. So the more we can do that, actually, the more we can educate the, the architectural community. And that's been really great definitely helps reach the masses and, and no doubt COVID did change everything. So that there's, there's a change conventional wisdom. It changed the way we, we, we plan. It changed the way we, we communicate and educate. So, uh, and, and so what is, what's the big one for you out there? Or one of the big ones for you? Yeah. You mean uh, like uh, what's the issue, issue? It, yeah, yeah. issues and solutions? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. It's great. And I think Neil will get into this um, qu quite a bit more here as we talk today, we get into the nitty gritty, but um, on my side, not all the coding manufacturers out there are supporting and providing the field applied touch up that Neil referenced. And so we get into a project and we have X, Y, Z, uh, you know, coding from the manufacturer and, you know, the, the installer, the GC, or someone calls up, calls them up and they say, we don't have anything for you. We don't have a touch up. And that's a big problem. So in my career, what I've found is that 
we, we dug deep and we found the solution. So you may not have the, the, the touch up material from ABC company, it may be from XYZ company, but the important part is it meets the standards and specifications that were written by the architect and, and demanded by the owner. And then most importantly, the color is a spot on match. And so we've, we've created resources where um, everything's a custom color match, by the way. So you get a factory coding and you have a color code and you have a color chip. It, that's, not, you, you, that's not reinventable um, just through the numbers. So you have to say, here's that color swatch, get it matched dead on. Um, and we do that in a successful way that we can get out in the field and make small spot repairs um, and not have to worry about you know, it not being improved from that side. Um, and then the, the importance of that and the reason it's, it's a requirement to have this custom color matches, you know, on liquid, you could be sprayed horizontally, you could be sprayed vertically, they're going to look different, you could have powder. And this is the part I think that Neil really liked to go into because I think it, it's really driving the industry is how do we get these things to match when they're, when they're applied differently. Yeah, and and Neil, let's 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 talk about that because again, like I said at the beginning of this podcast, I'm going to learn a little bit. I would have never in a million years, and this maybe shows my stupidity, have thought that applying it horizontally or vertically would give it a different color, a different end color. Um, that that stuns me actually. Uh, you know, and and I know there's color shifts and so on, but Neil, let's talk about you know what Chris was kind of leading you into both the adventures in the field uh, in touch ups and and then just the you know, application issues and so on. How, you know. You know, what are we looking at and how do we solve this? Well, I guess the situation is, you know, and again, um, leaning on my spectrum experience is that as a, as, a, as a custom coder, we get multiple components on the same job. We have plate for curtain wall, we have extrusions, we have, we have railings, we have you name it. Um, and it's, oh, I always try to advise the client to have one applicator, one vertical and one horizontal, okay? Now, when we deal with the extruder, an extruder has, they can't do more than 24 feet. We can do up to 35 feet. So they send us 10,000 pounds at 30 feet. Now we need from a color consistency standpoint is they, they need to send us a vertical color standard of the approved color. So we can tweak the paint on the horizontal line to match what the vertical applications look like, just as an example, okay? Uh, so I always try to advise my clients that if there's more than one applicator on the job, you need to send me a, um, a, uh, a, an actual production piece that was approved to try to eliminate any additional color matching issues between applicators. Right. Uh, so that's the way we try to, I mean, then we get, we, we, we set up a trial run and give them samples off our line to make sure it looks good from a vertical application, say it's an extruder like Keymarker Bonnell, uh, they sign off on the standard, then we're obligated to meet that specification moving forward. So. That's good. That's good. Oh, that's good advice. And and that's the, uh, how many people though do that when all is said and done? Nobody, do nobody, Matt, nobody does that. I can't tell you how many times that I've tried to say the paper chip will never match. What you need is a 12 by 12 or some standard off the applicator's line to approve the color. So, you know, in, in every, I can't tell you for 50 years, that, that is the biggest statement I like to leave with my clients is you have to have a physical line standard of the out because the paint's different, batch to batch is different, powder versus liquid's different, vertical versus horizontal is different. If you have a coil composite panel, the spray, architectural spray is not going to match that either. So you have to make sure that you coordinate with the architect, with the developer, who's on the job, who's butt up against other people's material yeah. make a concerted effort to get that, get that match corrected. It's big. That's big. That's big. All right. This is good. This is good. I, I got a few more coming for you guys. I've got Neil Chrisman, who is an absolute, uh, the king of all paint in my mind. Uh, uh, Pictura Advisory Group is the the new group that he's got going, but you know him from uh, his years owning Spectrum and, and everything else. Uh, a very, very, uh, important player in our industry, especially at the AMA level, or I guess it's now FGIA, correct? It's a different uh, different name. Uh, and then Chris Uncorvaya uh, of Edge Facade, uh, again, uh, a, a nice boots on the ground and a guy who's got a lot going on. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, we're, we're, we're mixing it up now. I got to go to a fun one. We, we just went through the heavy kind of adventures of our world, the, uh, the, the lack of alignment, the collaboration, uh, managing expectations, 
uh, you know, everything in, in Neil's just uh, the physical line standards and so on. So we go to a fun one to, to loosen things up for the audience. I'm in the winter doldrums. We just had snow here last week, so I'm very, very tired of, of winter. So I'm thinking about positive things. I wish I was in Tampa with you, Chris. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Chris. Uh, favorite vacation spot for you and why? <laughs> I, I hate to say this, but we live in a little slice of paradise here uh, yes. in Tampa. We're actually near the Clearwater area. So it, it is as simple as us to take the kids uh, to the beach on the weekend, set up camp nice. and just uh, enjoy the sunshine. So we don't go very far and we enjoy it here. So nice. Now, though, in the winter, like it is now, is the traffic like insane because of all of us northerners coming? Like I assume we're, we're, we're recording this during spring break. I assume traffic there must be bonkers right now. Yeah, I mean, for, first you get the snowbirds, right, starting right. in uh, really January and February, and then you get two full months of spring break. You get March and April oh, across the country. They, they, they vary by weeks. And add to that that we're in the heart of um, of a lot of the spring training training. Yes, you are. I'll be. Yep. Um, so that really puts it on you. So we uh, locals know how to avoid the highway systems at what time and <laughs> where to go and not to go. Very smart. Very smart. Now, I'm very curious, Neil's answer, because, Neil, I did not know you spend as much time in Asia and Europe as you did, uh, because when I got to know you, you know, you were you were in Youngstown. I I, I, I had no idea what your past was. So I, I, I'll be very curious where your favorite vacation spot is. But then again, I wonder if you even took a vacation in the last 50 years. <laughs> well, uh to be honest with you, I was very fortunate to travel the world at a company's expense, that yep. being people. So all the time and effort I put into Southeast Asia, uh, I would have to say if I had to pick any vacation destination in Southeast Asia, it would be Singapore or Hong Kong. Absolutely fantastic uh, places to, 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 to visit, to, uh, to enjoy. Singapore itself is one degree north of the equator. It's 85 degrees, sunny and hot every day. Uh, the, the, the culture, the climate, the golf, it was just impeccable. Um, my favorite place right now, sort of semi-retired is I'm a little bit further South and Chris, he's in Tampa. I, I rent a condo at Siesta Key, nice. which is one of the most beautiful beach places in the country. So I have old friends in Siesta Key and then down the Naples. So I kind of drift Good. back and forth, uh, doing a little, you know, golf, uh, boating, fishing, a couple cocktails here or there. Uh, it's all good right now. Love it. Love it. You deserve it. You deserve it. All right. A couple more questions before I move to my last two questions, though, I, I just want to make sure that, uh, is there anything else that I haven't covered with regards to, I'll start with you, Chris, with, with issues in the industry solutions that you're looking to push out there? Uh, yes. I think being, you're going, going like really micro here and talking about these, Please. these field applied repairs. Um, one of the largest, um, uh, innovations that we've seen and brought to market here is the use of water-based coatings. Um, and the reason for that, and these, these are water-based coatings that meet the AMA 2605 or FGIA uh, 2605 specifications and standards. And the reason for that is when we're, we're doing our application and our fixes, we're either in a space that is filled with trades and, and people around, so uh, or they're occupied. And what that means is we've eliminated the VOCs. We've eliminated the smells and the odors uh, associated with these high performance coatings. So having access to this new technology um, has really been a game changer in new construction. And you can imagine the same thing is true in restoration. Occupied structures, uh, exterior buildings uh, with access to for air and these odors to come into the structure, either through ventilation or even right through the windows, uh, especially when you're dealing with waterproofing. So um, it's been a game changer and um, we're, we're really excited about the future of, of where these coatings are gonna take us. Nice, nice. Neil, any any uh, other adventures or issues? I, I, I do. I think uh, if, if Chris being part of this advisory group, um, we, are, we have been called more than once into what we're considering some sort of a consulting litigation firm where we are called in because there is the building owners have massive failures. They don't right. understand why it's failing. Um, how did it occur? Who's at fault? Who do they go back on? So Chris and I have worked together in, in, in on various projects to identify, figure out, you know, the, the root cause of the failure. Um, and then he comes in and recommends how you fix it. Nice. So we have this litigation, restoration, repair, field market kind of piece of the consulting business, which I think a lot of people don't understand because I think they really need to get educated, not only on the factory applied baked on coatings, but what is their choice and what is the best warranty? What is the best 
performance of these exterior restoration coatings uh, to fix the problem that, that, that they have right now. Good, 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 good. I, I like it. So it's almost from soup to nuts. You know, yeah. you, you're covering all the different bases, which is, uh, I think, really, really important. Good. I like it. So, so Neil, we didn't see you at BEC this year. Did, did, did we, did you come? I, I, I was, it, like I said, it, it was so bonkers. Were you there or no? I, I was not there. Uh, Spectrum was there on, in a full force. Um, yep. But uh, I think, I, I believe it was in February. Uh, beginning of March, first, first week of March. Yeah. Yeah. I think I was still laying on the beach of Siesta Key. Smart man. Smart uh, man. But, uh, <laughs> but to be honest with you, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, I always, I think personally, I think Chris does, and my whole team at Spectrum, um, it's the best conference of all this MGA. You know, we go to AMA, we go to Extruders Council, sure. Power Coding Institute. I mean, there's so many associations that we belong to and are active in, but we feel that the tremendous amount of work and people that in excess of 800 people at BEC are all our end users, the curtain wall consultants, the architects, the developers, the the fabricators are all there, all in one room. Yeah. So I think it's at best probably the best conference within the industry all year. Um, I think something like we just talked about here would be a great topic for next year. I think you're think you're dead on. I I, I was I was hoping to to be able to kind of squeeze this in this year, but uh, definitely for next, so it would would be great, Chrissy. Yeah, you, you were there. Was that your first one, or you had been to previous ones? It, it wasn't, but for years, Neil advised. I mean, we needed to be there. And I'm gotcha. like, I don't understand it. I, I don't, why would I go there? And about five years ago, we made our first appearance, blown away. Uh, Neil's right, all of the end users and end customers uh, are there. Uh, there's no other event like it. We do AIA and Metalcon and other things. But th this one is just very unique with the, how um, how niche it is with the folks that you have together. They're, they're all aligned and they can all learn something from each other and network in, in a very high-end way. Uh, I thought this year in, in Nashville, it was electrifying again. Um, it was really great. I, I, I said this before, but I think there's another day that could be added to that and be very valuable. Yeah, I, I, I this year, this year, I, I think everything that could go right went right. And it just, it was just a perfect, uh, you know, perfect combination of things. It was pretty exciting. And, uh, and, and uh, I have a feeling that next year, uh, you know, you guys will, uh, you know, be being being heard from because this is a good subject and an interesting subject, and and I think there's a lot that we could do with it. Uh, so, so wrapping up, I know you're both uh, are extremely busy, uh, and so I just uh, you know very respectful of your time. I appreciate you doing the podcast. I always ask my guests about the market out there, and what, what's interesting about asking you two. Uh, is that you're you're on a different side of the market. When I have a glazer, you know they're looking at their backlog, and same with a fabricator and a manufacturer. You you both are in a consulting sort of form, and and so you may be seeing things differently in the markets, uh, you know, than, than others may see. So it's good information for the audience. Uh, so Chris, starting with you, how, how's the market this year in 2024? What are you feeling? Uh, you know, what's it looking like going forward? Yeah, I'm I'm very optimistic about where the economy is going, in particular in regards to to construction and 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 on the restoration side for me. And the reason I say see that or say that is we may see a slowdown in commercial new construction, right? Or there may be a, a glimpse into that window of that happening, or some people may say we're already seeing that. But the reality is, is that multifamily, in particular high-end condominiums, have not slowed down. That is going to continue. People are aging, number one. Number two, people are continuing to move geographically in the United States at substantial clips. And so that's going to continue to be a major part that drives us through any sort of slip or slowdown on the commercial side. Interesting. And, and when I look at multifamily, I look south of, of, of you and I look at from West Palm South, the, the multifamily building down there is just insane. Yeah, uh, it's wild. It, it, it is. It is. Neil, Neil, what are you seeing out there? And, and I mean, it, it, you know, it's funny when I was talking about how COVID's changed everything, you know, in the past, you know, you know, you had been through the recessions in the 70s, you've been through the recessions in the 80s, the interest rates at 25 percent and things like that. You've seen it. You've lived through it. But COVID kind of changed that all. And so so we don't know what to expect. What are you seeing out there? How are you feeling? You know, what's your gut telling you about the marketplace? Well, real quick, just as a personal example, when I first moved back to Pittsburgh with PPG back in 81, my interest rate on my house was 16%. <laughs> oh my so God. You can't, you know, right now, 3.2, even at 6% is a joke. Come on, I yeah. paid 16% <laughs> in 1981 to buy a house. Come on, you know. Oh my gosh. That, so, uh, every time I hear 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 that, I, it, blo it does blow my mind. I mean, it, but then again, you were paying back in eighty one. You were paying sixty five cents for gas too per gallon. So there is that. 
my first house was forty thousand dollars, which right. is about the size of a garage right now. Yeah. You know, but uh, to be honest with you, I'm I'm a little fearful. I I agree with what Chris is saying. I think it's a uh, it's a it's the market is, is 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 full steam ahead. But my concern is, as you had indicated, with COVID, so many people are working from home, um, and the new construction, which significant amount of people in this business are tied to. Um, that I don't see too many huts and yards or 30 story office buildings being built. Yeah. So on that horizon, um, I don't, I think it's going to be a slowdown. I don't think it's going to be a complete halt. Uh, there's going to be projects out there, but the size and the magnitude of some of the, the casinos, hotels, uh, you know, the huts and yards pro- type projects are going to be probably uh, a long way off. Uh, and I'm hoping that's not the case, but I really chew that not only that, but there's so much lease space now is available. So when the leases come up, they're not renewing them. So that lease space is now going to be available at a cheap discount for anybody that wants office space, right? Or they pull the trigger on a new building. So they're always our biggest market right now is university work. I can't tell you how much university work we have. Uh, as schools and hospitals, basically, right now. Yeah. So that's the strong part of our business right now. The 30 story office towers and casinos are sort of in the, you know, in the basement right now, so to speak. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Definitely a yeah. challenge, but it, it, good insight from both of you guys on that. And, uh, you know, resilience is our key, as I, I, I wrote you guys. I think this is a very resilient industry, and you, you both have seen it for, you know, a couple, you know, for you, Chris, more than 18 years. And, Neil, you've seen it for a long, long time. And we, we fight through these adventures out there, uh, you know, for sure. And what's interesting about our talk today, as, as I'm wrapping up, is that, you know, you brought up issues that 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 are are happening on a daily basis that I hope that people can – you know, lean on people like you, Neil, and you, Chris, with Edge Facades and then the Pictoria Advisory Group to, you know, jump on so we don't have these issues in the field because especially when work gets tighter, you d- you can't have mistakes. You know, you you can't have color mismatches uh, on jobs. I mean, you can't have them even when life is good, but when life is 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 not so good or struggling, you can't have these sort of mistakes. You know, that, that's, that's where I'm coming from. All right. So wrapping up, anything else to add, Neil? And then I'll go to you, Chris. Any, any, any final thoughts, Neil? No, not at all. I really appreciate the opportunity to get out there, get the message out there. Um, I will be eventually putting this, this group together with regard to a website and, and contact information. Um, you have my contact information yep. right now. Uh, uh, and, and if there's any, anybody that wants to get a hold of me directly, you can certainly give me a call on the cell phone or send me an email. All right. Yeah. And anybody who does, please, I, I will keep, get you connected with Neil and Chris. Any final thoughts? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank you, Max, for having us here today and, and Neil for uh, looping me in on this one. I know this was really uh, Neil's baby with you, Max, to, to get together and, and do this. And I'm, I'm just happy to participate and be able to add some value, hopefully, to the industry. Well, th- thrilled to get to meet you, Chris. And, and uh, I look forward to meeting you in person, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, at, at Glass Build in the fall or BEC. Uh, next year in Vegas, uh, I will make sure to find you. If you're not speaking, which is a possibility, the two of you guys, I will make sure to find you at next year's BEC. Uh, mm-hmm. I will track you down for sure. So, and That's if I don't right. see a glass pool before that, so very, very cool. Uh, guys, thank you so much. I've had Neil Chrisman, I've had Chris Incorvaya here, Edge Facade, uh, Pictura Advisory Group, all great people. Uh, that if you have any adventures on the paint side, on the coating side, These are your guys, folks. So uh, thank you so much, guys, for doing this. And I look forward to seeing you down the line. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Appreciate Appreciate it. it. Thank you. Okay, okay. Next up on the podcast, Tom Donovan, president of Thompson Innovative Glass. You can find them online at thompsonig.com. Uh, and and Tom is a guy that I've known for a while, and he's a, a force in our space. And I'm happy that I can get to know him a little bit better during the podcast. Tom, thanks for so much for doing the podcast. Wow, a force. That's, a force. That's a great compliment, Max. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is. And, and, and it's because I, you do things a little differently. And I think my, it might come from the background that you have. And that'll kind of lead me into the first question. You didn't you didn't follow the typical path that a lot of people follow into our industry where they were maybe in architecture, for instance. So talk a little bit going back, like where, where you grew up, uh, you know, where you went to school, where you were working and how you made it into uh, our industry. And now at Thompson IG. I could do that. Yeah, you are correct. Uh, as you know, I was born and raised. In the east side of Cleveland, yep. uh, you know, um, my father owned a packaging company, an industrial packing 
packaging company. It wasn't in the glass business. Pretty much my entire family worked for the company at some point in time, uh, e in, even including my mother. Uh, gotcha. From there, I uh, went to the University of Toledo, majored in accounting and finance. And after college, I took my first job with an aviation services company in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, they primarily supported uh, pre-board screening, checkboard screening, uh, did some ramp services. And, and at that position, I got pretty skilled in an ERP system by the name of J.D. Edwards. Okay. And that brought me to my next job up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I worked for, uh, started a job as a, uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, for a company involved in uh, design and engineering services, primarily supported the automotive sector. Right. Uh, did that for eight years. Uh, and then after that, I was asked to move all the way to the other side of the world. So I lived in uh, Cairns, Australia. Um, moved to Australia, my family and I, we, uh, I took a job with a Canadian public oil and gas company. Right. Um, 100% of their operations were in Papua New Guinea, so Papua New Guinea, uh, and um, I lived in Cairns, Australia. So my I family... didn't know that. I, I knew you worked in the oil world. I did not know it was in Australia, though. Yeah, well, we were based in Cairns, Australia, right on the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. Wow. Uh, my lovely wife and kids, uh, they enjoyed uh, walking three blocks down, hanging out in the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. Uh, and our operations were in Papua New Guinea, so we built okay. the first oil refinery. So we did a, a an oil refinery in uh, Papua New Guinea. So wow. and we also explored explored for oil and gas on there. So when my uh, tenure ended there, uh, I came back to the U.S. looking for a position, and that's in 2006. I was introduced to Dr. Harlan Biker. Yes. In the in the Suntut of uh, Dynamic Glass Technology, um, I was hooked then. Uh, so really, that was my start of uh, being in the glass business was in 2006. Gotcha. So with, yeah. It, it, so with it, Pleo, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Yeah, yeah. So with Pleo Tent, and um, soon after that, well, 2012, we acquired Thompson Innovative Glass. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so, so, and I and, and I'm glad you brought that up because 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 you know obviously Pleo Tent and Suntuitive you know had a role, and that's how you got into the space. And then you've come into Thompson, and and really. You know that this is where I was kind of getting in the beginning is you you've kind of uh, evolved it from that traditional you know fabricator that only did kind of stayed in their lane sort of thing. And the one thing you don't do is you don't stay in your lanes. You you know, you're you're trying you're trying a little bit of everything. And and so well you know quick back up. So so you come back you you come back to America. You meet Doctor Biker Harlan. Harlan's one of those brilliant types that just is is he he's beyond all of us, right? Oh, he pushes all of us, you know, you know, we're always trying to innovate, come up with something new. Um, yeah, it's, it's, he's a great, he's a, he's a great force in this company. It, it's awesome. So. so. So with you now leading the way and you've taken Thompson into like a whole nother level because pre, you know, pre, you know, Harlan's ownership and you getting involved, Thompson was that traditional, you know, regional fabricator, you know, with IG and tempered. And, and you've now, you know, you still have those co components, but you do so much more. Uh, and, and, and so how did, how, you know, was it just like you coming in and saying, no, we can't be like everybody else. And we've got to, you know, develop a bunch of new products, which we'll talk about, or, you know, what, what, what drove the change? Wow. Uh, that's good. What drove the change? Uh, it, it was a lot of hard work, Max. I tell you, uh, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy, but. You know, it was a, it was tough. You know, there's, you know, myself coming in this, uh, yeah, you know, Tom, you're an oil and gas guy, or you're a automotive guy, or you're a aviation, you know, airline industry. But really, getting to back to the fundamentals of a business, what, what really, what really, we saw as what I view as what grew, grew us and as a company was two pronged. One was uh, first class customer service. Uh, yeah. You, got to be there for the customer max i you know that's that's everything being friendly uh you know my my experience in life i i you know of going through business people like to work with individuals they like yes. and so we we really pride ourselves on being friendly the other one is response you need to reply you need to follow up you need to pick up the phone 
when it's good or bad, um, you need to properly reply to emails, texts, you know, following up on RFQs, quotes, everything. Um, you know, those are big things. You know, and, you know, the third one is listening to the customer. You need to listen. You need to listen to the customer and don't be nervous about taking on those challenging projects. Uh, yeah. You know, that's the one thing we, we, we're, we're successful at not saying we don't, we don't like saying no to the customer, like, wow, okay, let's think of how we could do this or let's, let's talk about it. Um, a lot of us, a lot of our customers find us and come to us uh, because we're willing to take on those challenging projects um, when we do that. And, and then also too, the big one is asking com- customers for feedback. Right. So we, we have a good program that we do customer reviews and we ask them how we're performing, what we're doing. Um, but at the same time, you need to be able to uh, use that feedback also. Don't ignore it. How could you improve? So really, when we go down to that, you know, it's really that first class customer service. No, no um, doubt. No doubt. And, and, and the lack of fear uh, was big in, in, in not, you know, and being able to create things. And so one of the one of the areas was a combination of areas is, you know, bird friendly and security glass. You know, and those are areas that that a company, you know, uh, you know, previously to you guys running Thompson, you'd never get into those sort of products. And now when it comes to those products, it, it, you know, we'll start with the bird friendly. You yeah. have multiple, multiple, multiple options. You know, you're a, definitely a, a a true single source when it comes to that. That And that's something that sets you apart. Hey, before I jump into that, uh, Max, if you don't yeah. mind, if I back up a little bit and talk about where I think our success has been, too. Yeah, by know, all means, please. Work. Well, first class customer service, but the second biggest one is our ISO certified right. quality management. I just system. saw that you just you just you just re up that you just you know got recertified. Yeah, so we just went through our uh, three year recertification, um, and and what we've seen and I've seen it in other businesses. My whole background is companies that have structured procedures and policies are make it effective. That's what grows the bit. You got to have that foundation. In our development of our structured procedures and policies, this started 10 years ago. This didn't happen overnight. Right. So, you know, the first phase of this was our business intelligence. So we, we went, when we got into Thompson just after 2012, we looked at this and we upgraded the, all the information systems. So we moved to a new ERP system. We, um, we added a, a preventative maintenance system to manage the equipment in the, the maintenance and also implemented this t- statistical process control system. So we were getting real time data from our processes and using that as a feedback. So once we got through that, the, the systems point, the business intelligence, we jumped into training. So we went in the training. We, po- it, we had long, long sessions putting training videos together. So we have over, you know, that was the foundation of Thompson University. So we yeah. created two about, uh, we started Thompson University. Today, we have over 130 different videos for each position in the plant. Um, and that that really supports our whole, you know, doing things the right the first time or continuously repeating We're, the, the, the repetitive nature of it. Doing, you know, we work two shifts here. So really is everyone doing the work support and doing the work the same time every time. Yeah. So yeah. once we got our... Then that leads in what you were talking about, our ISO certification. You know, once we had the business intelligence, the systems, the training, that led to the, the implementation of our QMS, our quality management system. And then in 2001, we had it ISO certified. Um, and then three years, this, this past January of three years, we just had it recertified. Nice. So, Con- so- congratulations to you on that. I, I, that, was, that was big news and that's a, it's a good thing. And it's not easy. You know, you just don't sign up for it and get it. You know, I mean, you got to go through the process. And uh, I, I remember, you know, it's been a few years. I remember, you know, when I got to see some of your training videos, you probably had, you know, 70 or 80, you know, when I saw them, you know, so, uh, but you were way ahead of the curve because that was before my glass class that you had videos out, you had your own. So that was, that's something to be said, you know, props to you and the team there for sure. Yep. No, thank you. No, it's, we're very proud of our videos uh, and it helps. It's, you know, or your know, staff, um, you know, me personally, I'd rather watch a, a video, listen to books on tape or watch anything versus reading. And right. I, it's just convenient. Um, as you know, I, I always hear you, Max, I'm listening to something while I'm on the treadmill. So, there you go. There you go. That's it. That's it. 
So, well, so then now let's talk about the products then the bird friendly, you know, yes. I, that, that one's always been one. And you've, you've heard me talk about this on the podcast and, and, and I, I have always talked about how it caught me off guard when it first got brought up, but you dove right into it uh, and with, with all those options. And, and, uh, and that's something that uh, not everybody, you know, wanted to do. And that's put you in a good place as being a, a real major source for bird friendly glazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, you know, we started getting into bird friendly early on in the uh, Suntuitive days. So right. we started doing some of the testing with Suntuitive uh, before it became, you know, so popular at this time. It is, yeah. When you look at bird friendly, uh, you know, I just, it's very safe to predict it's not going away anytime soon. No. Uh, you know, the, the growth of the, the amount of, uh, demand for bird friendly solutions. Um, I was at a recent conference, NGA conference, and uh, one of the industry expect experts was predicting that there will be bird friendly legislation in every U.S. state. This is his opinion in every U.S. state within the next 20 years. Wow. Wow. So they're talking about bird friendly being out there. Um, and that's why we aligned ourselves. We know there's different technologies. Uh, to meet our customers' requests. And uh, so, yeah, we partnered up with uh, several um, suppliers that, uh, you know, have different bird-friendly glass technologies. And, uh, you know, and then we also have our in-house options. So we have our in-house uh, bird-friendly options. But, yeah, we want to be the be able to be have all these uh, bird-friendly glass technologies to support our customers' needs. Yeah, one 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 stop uh, does it all. One stop does it all. And so you, you've been in the news for, for a couple of things. One was the ISO uh, recertification. One was the Guardian Glass Award winning uh, that was announced at BEC. And one was a brand new plant on the west side of Michigan. Yeah. Uh, I talk about that. The new plant. What's going in there? Uh, I assume it's security glass. Uh, you know, and we kind of touched on it real brief before. But uh, what's going in in the new plant? What's that all look like? Yeah, it's exciting times on the west side of the state of Michigan. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, uh, we, we're we moving into a new facility, a new building. And, uh, you know, it's really to support our the growth of our advanced lamination business okay. sector. Gotcha. The goal of this is to cre create additional capacity. Uh, we want to create additional capacity. Uh, the new building is only a half mile down from our current facility, down the street. So, and that's the building we've been operating out of for the past 17 years. We've gotcha. been in the area. Um, yeah, so the primary focus of that advanced lamination business is bullet resistant, bullet resistant products. Um, we, all, we will also support, um, you know, incorporating technology, different technologies too. So we have a big effort on looking at different technologies and working on incorporate, incorporating them into glass products. Yes. Uh, we're also doing some solar technology, working with some of the solar group. Uh, we're we uh, switchable glass, so yep. we're a switchable glass. We working with different technologies and uh, on the switchable side, and then also heated glass. Yes. So we've been uh, we've been playing with heated glass for uh, you know the last three or four years. Um, we think we finally came up with a product that we feel that may gain some traction in the market. So we're doing some prototypes right now in and the heated glass standpoint. So this new facility, we're bringing in new equipment. We're moving some equipment. Um, we, we, we're already moved. Um, we hope to be up and running on that new line uh, by September of this coming year. Right. Then uh, we'll be, some of the equipment's moving out of our existing facility in Fenton. Uh, so we're, we're going to move some of that equipment to the west side of the state, which will free up some room uh, in our Fenton operation to uh, get some add on some new capabilities. So we're looking Super. forward to that also. So. Super. So so Fenton stays doing what it's doing, and this new advanced exactly. laminated facility will just uh, you know go sophisticated and be led by BR glass, and then uh, right. everything else that you come up with. Okay. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Good. Good. It, it's ex ex exciting stuff uh, going on there in the world of Thompson IG. I've got Tom Donovan, president of Thompson Innovative Glass. See them online, ThompsonIG.com. Uh, follow him on LinkedIn as well. Uh, and so, so always uh, halfway through the podcast, I always have a fun question. And this one, I, I, I can't wait because uh, yeah. you and I were supposed to have a pod a, a while back. We got, we, we had to postpone. Uh, and so I've been waiting for this answer. You are, you, you, you grew up in, in the Cleveland area, East side. 
uh, huge Cleveland Brown, Brown fan, biggest one I know. Uh, and, and so I'm really curious on, on your top three all-time Cleveland Browns. And and as I wrote you in the note, you can't say Jim Brown because that's too easy. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. so, so well, who, who are the top three Cleveland Browns in uh, Tom Donovan's world? Uh, it's funny, Max. Uh, you know, I'm actually um, attending the go to the Hall of Fame with my brother this coming okay. weekend. First Love time it. I've ever being from Cleveland. The first time I've ever no uh, way football Hall of Fame. Yes, I know your brother did some glass on there. Yes, he did. So, yes, he did. Yes, he did. I'll be yes. looking for his logos on the glass. Yeah. But uh, uh, first time going there. And the reason I'm going there because they have a special. Uh, it's, it runs for I think a month, forty five days. It's a uh, uh, the history of the Browns. So nice. They have a whole, display of the history of the Browns. So, um, you know, I promise, yeah, it, you know, it may go in and list reading the history. It may change my number three pick, but it's not, definitely not going to change my one and two. Okay. So, so yeah, starting off, uh, my number one would absolutely be Bernie Kosar. Gotcha. Uh, yep. You know, I, you got to appreciate uh, a player that grew up in the Cleveland area, grew up a Browns fan, always been a Browns fan, uh, wanted to play for the Browns. You don't see many of those often. Uh, and you know, when Belichick, you remember when Belichick let him go, that would have been in 1993 Belichick. Yeah. Fired him. So Belichick was a coach, fired him, got, well, canned him, let him go, just cut him. Then he got picked up by Dallas. But when they did that, Max, I, at work, I created a shrine. I had a Bernie Kosar shrine in my office and friends of mine had connections to the local news and they came in and they actually did a story. They came in and interviewed me when. Kosar got let go, but you know, I, I don't know if you've seen this, you know, and I didn't watch it close enough, but in the the new Apple series Dynasty about the New England Patriots, it's 10 episodes. And there's an episode on Belichick and 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 his past at Cleveland and when he made the call to cut Kosar. Yeah. And well, the protest the protests in town and people marching and people crying. Oh my gosh, you were probably in there and I wasn't I was paying close there. enough attention. I'll have to pull it out one day. I know it's on a VHS tape in my yeah. basement somewhere. So, you know, taping off the local. I was off the VCR back in the days and, you know, have my shrine in the office. And I, I may have probably to have more hair and not as much gray then, a little thinner. But I, yeah, I, I'll, <laughs> so, I'll, have, I'll have to I'll have to figure out which episode that was and, and go back to it. But it's in there. There's a whole section in one of the episodes about Belichick and, and uh, cutting Bernie Kosar, kind of how it made him as a coach. All right. Number two. Who's your number, number two? two uh, you know, keep in mind, I'm, I'm old Browns, right? So I'm yeah. before the move in, uh, 96, uh, yeah. uh, number two would be, uh, Hanford Dixon, Quarter, cornerback Hanford Dixon. Absolutely. Great pick. Great pick. You know, I, I love Hanford. Uh, you know, he's, he's known for, he's the one that's uh, credited for naming the, the dog pound. Yep. Yep. So, you know, have him barking and all that, you know, it's one of those things, uh, I got to stick with. And this number three one, it's, you know, I go back and forth just because of his, after leaving the Browns, but it, it's got to be Ozzie Newsome, tight end yeah. Ozzie Newsome. Yeah. Another Legend. one that was with the Browns, um, was the Browns his entire career. Uh, he he had the, the single game re receiving yards record up until uh, good old Josh Gordon beat it. Um, <laughs> And we all know we don't need to get into that. No. So Josh should stay. And then um, Cooper. Um, Amari, Amari Cooper, Cooper. Yeah, asked, this past year. You know, but, you know, Ozzy, I, I just remember those days. Everyone's saying they wanted to be Ozzy, Ozzy. And what a cool name. You know, hey, yep. there's Ozzy. You know, my my distaste was his loyalty to the Ravens after that. So, yeah. oh, I, it's hard, but. Yeah. That's I I don't know how I would have reacted. I mean, if if you know, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and you know, as a you know, you know as a, yeah. yeah, as a Steeler fan, I don't know, you know, how you you know, I, you know, as a Brown fan, you know, fan, I feel bad for all of you guys because it was just such a brutal thing having the franchise ripped out of your hands. But at least you got it back, and at least you got to keep the name too. <laughs> You know, you know, that that's the, the big thing is keeping the name. Uh, I, I I think uh, Baltimore should have got, you know, if they did it, they should have at least got the Colts back. But regardless, I'm glad uh, I'm glad uh, you, you got the name back. And uh, it seems like the team's uh, headed in the right direction this year. Tough division, yeah, but uh, headed in the right direction. I want to come back and play for them. It's, it's yeah. hard to. And I'm not going to get into your Steelers loyalty. You know, we don't need to get into that. No, I, I, hey, I've lived in Detroit longer, so I've become more of a Lions fan. So I, that's uh, I, I do like my my underdog Lions for sure. I got Tom Donovan, president at Thompson Innovative Glass. He's a busy man, and I've held him up a ton. But I got a few more questions. 
Uh, one thing I really admire about you, and when I say that you're a force as well, is because the way you've thrown yourself in on the technical side of things. You haven't been afraid to attend the conferences. You haven't been afraid to bring up issues that you see. Uh, a lot of times people come to the conferences and you know they sit back and listen. And if they don't like something, they keep it to themselves and they, you know, then, you know, talk to other people about it. They don't, they don't, you know, bring it to the forefront. You are active in it. You're interested in it. You're taking a role. Uh, You know, I I think that that's, that's, that's huge. How was it like it though, for you first going in there and first going to a conference and settling into it? Were you hesitant? You know, what was the feeling? And then how did you get more comfortable as you went along? Yeah. Well, first of all, you're right. You know, Max, I'm all in on this. I, I, I tell you, I'm all in on these technical conferences. You know, the first one I attended was in July 22. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where my main focus of going there was to learn more about school security, right. uh, the school security glazing efforts, and then that new ASTM standard F3561, learn about that. So that was my main focus. So going to Chicago, it was close to, you know, Michigan. So right. going down there and visiting that. So I go there and I visit that and and I learned a ton about school security and active shooter and going through all the new ASTM standard, but it was everything else that opened my eyes. Uh, all the other topics that was covered, they were so relevant and important to Thompson. It, it, it blew me away. Um, and, you know, since that attending, I haven't missed a conference since. Right. Uh, I I participate in some of the participate in some of the subcommittees. I'm on several of those, and and I do. I question everyone in our industry. If anyone ever questions what the NGA does for our industry, they, they need to go to one of these technical yeah. conferences. It's it's unbelievable. There's a lot of coverage, and like in any uh, and in the any of the NGA conferences, the information. But it's just the networking, um, getting there, the networking, uh, you know, learning a lot from these technical. Um, individuals that support different companies. Yeah, it's been, it's tremendous. And uh, like I said, I'm going to, I'm all in on this and I'm going to continue going it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So what are some of the key areas you think, uh, you know, now that you're attending these things and you're, you're active uh, and have been, you know, what, what are some of the things that we need to keep paying attention to in our industry? I know one of them is attracting people, uh, but that's, that's everybody has that issue. What, what else do we need to, to focus on as an industry to get better at? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, when we talk about EPDs, um, you know, all the EPDs, the environmental issues and all that, there was a topic that came up at the uh, last uh, technical conference in Charleston. Um, they had in uh, glass from Europe um, mm-hmm. talking about what they're doing with end of life building glass. So, you know, it was yeah eye opening, you know, about the amount of end of life building glass that gets recycled. I thought they re- if I recall, it was like 5% of the glass coming off the buildings gets recycled in right. Europe. Um, but all the efforts on doing that, I, I would, you know, it's not easy. Believe me, it's not easy. I love watching those old casinos in Vegas get blown up. But yep. if you're, you're not going to get that, uh, you know, seeing those. But uh, I would say that'd be one area, you know, looking at that. You know, another one, I don't know if it is possible, but I, um, you know, I look at uh, our industry on the commercial side. We're primarily in the commercial side versus the residential. But, you know, if there is a way to come up with more standard sizes, uh, standard size quantity of sizes, uh, I, you know, it, it's it's challenging throughout the whole supply chain. I, I do feel that everyone has, you know, whether it's you go to all the different sizes of glass and quantities and being able to track it, measuring it, it would all the way through the whole supply chain from you know, measuring, you know, all the way through, you know, putting the units together, the metal side, the installation, the glass fab, you know, it's difficult. The, the, the time and effort it takes is tracking individual low, low units by opening and doing all that. It's, it, yeah, I would say, you know, like I said, that, is it possible? I don't know, but I, you know, it's one of the areas that I, I just feel the whole industry could be run more efficient. Yeah, and, and it, well, it would be nice uh, at least to get a little bit further to that. But that's that's definitely a challenge. The SKUs, the amount of SKUs are insane, uh, and and a lot of products that are just so close too. You know that there's not that big of a leap. Yeah, you, know, you know, and you're only talking a little bit of percentage numbers, and that's got to be challenging for you because you have to inventory a lot of that stuff. Mm-hmm. 
you know, so, uh, and, and I, I'm with you on the EPDs and the HPDs. I had a conversation uh, two weeks ago and, and I was asked about how that's coming in our industry. And I said, for a lot of people, they don't even know what it is and they're hoping somebody else will take care of it. And that's kind of how I, I, I see that. So that's how we're going. Uh, all right, last one for Tom Donovan, President Thompson Innovative Glass. Uh, great company, has a bunch of stuff going on. And, and I assume you've got... Uh, an excitement for the rest of this year and into next year. How's your feeling? How's your, you know, how's your, uh, your scope going for our economy and, and your business particularly? You know, like I said, we're just going to stick to the basics. Like I pointed out earlier, um, really a lot of that is our, uh, you know, focus on that customer service, that satisfaction. And then, uh, you know, looking at uh, improving on our QMS and running, running more efficient. You know, I mean, what you're going to, there's no doubt our company, you know, we're going to continue the focus on innovation. That's what we are. You know, we're innovation. We're always looking for new glass products. Um, you know, it's, it's guaranteed that we're going to develop some new uh, glass, glass products, um, some new materials this year, some new processes. And, and that's all in an effort to improve our, our partners, our, comp our customers' profitability. While we're doing all that on the innovation side and looking to, uh, to expand our into the, the, the technology side, we're not going to lose focus on our quality policy. Mm -hmm. When I talk about our QMS, um, our quality policy, a lot of times we call it our high five here at, uh, at Thompson, you know, where we focus on, you know, everything about customer satisfaction, vendor relations, awareness, ownership. And the big one, continued improvement. You know, that's, you know, continuous improvement. That's what we we strive and uh, strive on getting better and better every day. So, yeah, that's 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 what you can expect out of Thompson in this year and, and beyond. So It's a good call. That's a good call. And continuous improvement is something that people sometimes uh, gloss right on over, too. I mean, uh, you know, they, they, they get to a point where they're comfortable. You know, and, and, and so I guess for you, you can't get to a point where you're comfortable because you got a brand new plant to open and stock yeah. and move. There's yeah. no there's no sitting back for you or Jeremy or Lauren or the rest of the team. I mean, uh, you got a good team around you, which makes it, it makes it a little easier, too. And you point out it's a new plant. So, you know, it's being laid out. We're doing the infrastructure. And so there's no excuses either. Right. I mean, exactly. you can only point the finger at yourself if it's not set up properly and running it. But, you know, our our uh, C CTO. um Mike Brookheis, I yep. had all the confidence in the world in him. So. Yep, another good guy, another good guy. Well, very, very cool. I appreciate you taking the time. Thompson IG, Thompson Innovative Glasses on the on the uh, on a roll uh, from bird friendly to security to schools and so on. And uh, Tom Donovan leading the way. Plus, he had he he you you. I'm so happy you picked Hanford Dixon. That proved how good of a fan you are because he is right. a legendary Brown. So you came through for me on that one. Uh, this was real good stuff. Thank you so much for doing the podcast. And, uh, hey, what, and yep. I, yeah, and I, yeah, I thank you for that. And I can't thank you for everything you do for our industry. Uh, you're, you're awesome. I appreciate yeah. it very much. Well, I, I try. I get to work with people like you, uh, you know, oh, uh, yeah. around the day and it makes it, makes it good. So no, I, I'm honored by that, but uh, I love, I love seeing what you're doing and uh, I'm excited for uh, Thompson's future and the way it uh, supports our industry. And so thank you very much for that and coming it's to been the an honor and a privilege. Thank you, Max. Coming to the shows and everything. So Tom, Tom Donovan, president Thompson, innovative glass, Thompson, IG, uh, good company. And uh, again, thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Thank you, Max. Okay, okay, that wraps things up for this month's From the Fabricator podcast. Uh, a lot of fun, uh, some real interesting things. Learned a lot from Neil and Chris and Tom. Uh, that was really, uh, you know, eye-opening in some levels. Uh, again, this podcast brought to you by MyGlassClass.com from the National Glass Association. Check that out, MyGlassClass.com, 24-7, 365 training. You need the training for your folks, train to retain, train to, you know, uh, get ahead of the rest of the industry. Check it out at myglassclass.com. As always, I end each one talking about some TV, and this month's recommendation is The Capture. It is uh, on Peacock. I know some people are watching it on Apple, but I'm watching it on Peacock. Thanks to Ben Beeler for the recommendation. Pretty good show. I'm not done with it yet, uh, but it's got my attention. It's got me hooked. Uh, interesting uh, show from the BBC. Again, I'm watching it on Peacock. You may be able also to find it on Apple. It is called The Capture. Uh, gets you really thinking about video, deep fakes, and so on. So some good stuff there TV-wise. And uh, it's been a good treadmill show. And that's, uh, you know me, that's what I care about. 
That does it for me for this month. Uh, I thank everybody for listening, watching, supporting. It means a lot. I really do appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing everybody again in this space next month. Thank you very much and see you then. Oh, the music is stopped.